It's shortly before sunrise on Tuesday. Damar Hamlin is alive. He has vital signs. And, boy, he's got the affection, the love, the prayers of not just a football community, but also the local community. Good morning to you. Good Tuesday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Steelers. It comes your way bright and early every weekday. If you're into hockey and or baseball, I also offer Daily Shots of Penguins and Pirates where you found this. I had plenty to offer regarding your favorite football team on today's episode. And I, like you, like everyone else who watched this young man, formerly of Pitt, formerly of Pittsburgh Central Catholic, formerly of McKee's Rocks, collapse after an innocuous play in which he tackled a Bengals wide receiver in Cincinnati and just went down. Shortly before 3 a.m. today, the Bills issued a statement that I'm going to read it to you. DeMar Hamlin suffered a cardiac arrest following a hit in our game versus the Bengals. His heartbeat was restored on the field, and he was transferred to the UC, that's University of Cincinnati Medical Center, for further testing and treatment. He is currently sedated and listed in critical condition. What this statement doesn't say is that Hamlin's also been intubated. He's getting assistance, life support, and it's terrifying. It's going to be terrifying, I would think, for people throughout the sport, not just in the NFL. I also think you're going to see in different ways reactions that take it too far, that connect it too much to the sport when we can't know everything about any player's medical history or medical underlying truths. But here's where the responsibility part comes in. Neither the National Football League nor the NFL Players Association, sadder to say, are to be trusted with this sort of thing. There needs to be an outside, independent, and I don't know who'd govern it. I'm nowhere near that smart, knowledgeable, expansive on this sort of thing. But whoever it is that it oversee the ultimate study regarding athlete safety in football, would need to be allowed to operate 1,000% independent of any other entity. And no, that's not me being over the top. That's not me saying that every time something happens to one individual, this needs to happen. That needs to be commissioned. I didn't do that when Ryan Shazier went down in the same stadium, and I'm not going to do it now. However, we all benefit from more information for more data, for more studying. And I will be very hard to convince that Hamlin would have just collapsed as an ordinary citizen if he were not participating in a football game. What can you expect at Point Park University in downtown Pittsburgh? Respect, rigor, relevance. That's the Point Park pledge. You'll be treated with respect while being challenged and supported academically to graduate with career-ready, relevant skills. Visit pointpark.edu to learn more. That's as far as I'll take that, uh, obviously. Uh, the, the thing that you can do after something like this is start getting uh, you know, a- angry or frustrated, exasperated, and looking to point fingers at this place or that place. And I know there were a lot of people that were upset with the league and Roger Goodell because of the way they handled even the postponement of the game, apparently the league told both the Bills and the Bengals that they had five minutes to get ready to restart, and both head coaches met with each other at midfield and were like, there is no way we are playing football tonight. That's, on a peripheral basis, something that is a a symptom, 
I'd say of this league having its collective head in the mud over these matters and why I would not trust, again, the league or even the union to do the right thing by its own membership. Remember, we're talking about a league that couldn't handle something as basic as concussions on a mature level until independent concussion spotters got involved. Remember that the Miami Dolphins would throw Tua Tagovailoa onto the field pretty much wrapped as a mummy if they had to, to try to win a game. Still, still, they might do it again this weekend. These things are so deeply seated, so uh, entrenched in the culture of the sport and among management and among owners and even again among union people that the only way for there to be a sea change in terms of how football collects as much knowledge as it can is to go independent, all the way independent. Now, now, setting that aside, there's a young man in trouble right now. There's a young man's family, local family, and all the way to the bone Pittsburgh family that's in trouble right now and that needs the power of prayers, of positive thinking if you're not religious, of contributing to the toy fund that Hamlin had started for underprivileged youth in our area for which I'll leave the link anywhere and everywhere that you would see and hear this particular episode. It's horrifying. It's, it's, it's petrifying. Uh, you want to look away, but at the same time, you can't do that. You can't do that. You have to find out why. Not just for the health and well-being of, of the participants of this great game, but also for this great game. I often think about the concussion symposium over which I presided a few years back at the Carnegie Science Center. And Merrill Hodge was one of the panelists. And Merrill came at this really hard. No matter what I'd bring up, Merrill would come back with, it's not about football. It's about the medicine involved. It's about understanding how to deal with these situations in all walks of life. Don't blame it on football. And he might be right, he might be wrong, but it's incumbent on all of us to find out. When we come back, J1Q. Shot of Steelers is brought to you by our friends at Mike's Beer Bar. They're located directly across Federal Street from PNC Park. They are the one, the only, the premier destination in Pittsburgh for craft beer. More than 500 craft beers available, more than 350 of those local, and more than 80 of those on tap. Mike's can't be topped, not for beer, not for the awesome kitchen and menu that's available, not for all the special events that are going on there. Check them out online at mikesbeerbar.com. Mike's Beer Bar, right across Federal Street from PNC Park. Today's J1Q comes from Brandon, who asks, hey DK, happy new year. Under Matt Canada, it seems like the Steelers offense plays horribly for three quarters, and then when in need of a comeback drive, the offense starts to click. It seems to happen to both Ben Roethlisberger last year and now Kenny Pickett this year. Did the Kenny comeback drive in Baltimore truly shed a light on how bad Canada's play calling really is? Well, Brandon, I don't know how much time you spend on social media. I received a tweet yesterday afternoon from a longtime uh, listener, and reader in Ukraine of all places. And yes, he's doing fine. He's over on the Western side, which isn't being hit nearly as hard by the war. And he noticed something 
in the television footage where at one point, and it's a split second, you blink and you miss it. Kenny looks over to the Steelers sideline and he motions with his hands over his ears as if he can't pick up the radio reception. He can't communicate with the booth, meaning he can't communicate with Canada. The next thing you see is Kenny looking down at his list of plays on his wrist. All quarterbacks have these. Kenny looking down at that play would strongly suggest he was looking for a play because he couldn't get one through his radio. So he goes to the line and guess which was the next play? Yes, the 20 yarder to Pat Fryermuth. Now, the internet generally does not need a whole lot of help in starting a conspiratorial fire. So once I shared this individual's theory and the accompanying video, everybody came up with Kenny is purposely ignoring Canada. He's pulling a trick that Ben used to use whenever he didn't want to hear from Canada or Randy Feetner or Todd Haley or whatever. I'll tell you what I think. One, we will not ever know this. If it's brought up with Mike Tomlin at his press conference today, you're not going to hear anything remotely resembling an answer. If it's brought up with Kenny in his weekly meeting with reporters, and that's tomorrow, he's going to say, oh, no, no, that was just one play. I mean, it, it, it went in and out, and everything was fine after that. Coach Canada called a great game. And if it's brought up with Canada, <laughs> whenever he meets with reporters on Thursday, it's going to be, we just need to score more points. We just need to score more points. Am I done here? Is this over yet? We just need to score more points. And that's going to be the end of it. So we're not going to have some sort of magical aha moment where you find out what actually happened. Second, I really doubt it. I really, really doubt it. Uh, I don't doubt that Kenny would have had to look down at his wrist to call a play if, in fact, the radio went out for that one moment. But I'd really, really be surprised if that's something that you could pull off the whole way down the field with the various stoppages they had with a two-minute warning mixed in there, let's not forget, and with the Ravens having burned up, and you'll recall this now as I say it, all of their timeouts. That's an awfully long time for a quarterback to pretend he can't communicate with his OC, but it sure is fun to think about. And it's even more fun to contemplate that Kenny is being the rogue, the renegade and bucking it to the evil coordinator. My understanding from talking to almost all of the offensive players in that drive, because that was my focal point for the column that I wrote on DK Pittsburgh sports is that Canada actually called a pretty good drive. I know nobody wants to hear that, but I believe in being fair about these sort of things. I still think he's not the man for the job and that he should be replaced, but I also believe that he called a really good drive. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everyone listening to Daily Shot of Steelers. Again, here's hoping for the best for Tamar Hamlin. Let's meet up again tomorrow. 